Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Family Tree House, a podcast series brought to you by Story, where people that have a passion for genealogy, storytelling, or both. I am your host, Heather Honert, and today I am very excited to have a very special guest with us today, Devin Noel Lee from the Family History Fanatics. I, when I looked at your biography, before I let you go crazy, this is what I found, and it just floored me. It says, follow a woman who wrote a rough draft of 120 ancestors in just one year and published 60 scrapbooks, one memoir, and two ancestral biographies. I think, Devin, that you must be a superwoman. Welcome <laughs> to the show. I don't, I'm not superwoman. I was just very much inspired by a sense of urgency. So, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. That is just, that is incredible. Well, welcome. Why don't you tell us, um, Devin, a little bit about your background, kind of how you got started in the field of family history and storytelling. W where did you start? Okay. So I'll try to be brief because I am the social <laughs> one on family history fanatics, so I can talk forever. <laughs> um, so it's it all so really good. Good. It all, my interest in family history all began when I was a teenager. My mom had told me stories of uh, my relatives. We lived in Texas. They all lived in Ohio. So the, and this is the day before the internet and my family wasn't letter writers and we also wasn't weren't phone callers because that was expensive. And so all I had to rely on was my mom and her stories. So as a teenager, I started a project uh, to earn a religious uh, award similar to the Girl Scouts or the Eagle Scouts highest honor. In our church, it was one of the highest honor. And you got to select your project. And I selected that project. Now, spoiler alert, I never actually finished that award, but I have been doing that project <laughs> ever since. So um, that's how I got started in because my mom was a storyteller. I gravitated towards storytelling. And also in high school, I dabbled a little bit in the high school newspaper until I had to choose between band and newspaper and band one. Um, <laughs> but then in college, my mom started a newspaper. And so I started writing articles for her. Now, mind you, I am terrible at spelling. I still am to this day. People find errors all over Family History Fanatics and my new channel, Write Your Family History. So that's all right. But I learned the art of storytelling from my mom and from journalism. And that's where I'm at today. And, you know, Devin, I tell people all the time, I used to teach high school English and I tell uh -oh. people all the time to, to me, it, no, you're good. <laughs> to me, it's more about um, just getting the story down. You know, I, right. I don't care if things are misspelled or you don't have it grammatically correct. I mean, it's just more about getting that story written down. And I, I think people have that fear, you know, right. that people are going to judge them for their writing. So, right. well, I have a philosophy, an imperfectly written story written down or even verbalized is better than a perfectly crafted story in somebody's head. Who's dead? Right. Absolutely. <laughs> Well, and, and I think too that, yeah, I just, I just did a, a newsletter post on this that, you know, I, I could just take one sentence from an ancestor and I don't care what it looks like. If I had something from an ancestor from a long time ago, that was just barely written down, I wouldn't care what it looked like, you know, Absolutely. just to have that, that information. Absolutely. So why, why do you think that storytelling is such an important part of, you know, family history as a whole? You know, I think a lot of people get hung up on the names, the dates and the places. And why do you think storytelling is so important? Well, it's all about connection and belonging when you have a story. So I, a lot of people try to say I'm connected to some famous person. Well, I'm connected to a drunk, a bread man and a professor. So, and I love my drunk, my professor and my bread man. And I know stories about each one of them. And, you know, there are, there's a woman of faith. There is a woman who adopted my grandmother. She didn't have any children, uh, couldn't have children in the 1920s. She would, she adopted my grandmother and my grandmother's older sister. And um, when I heard the story of how she came to adopt my grandmother, I just fell in love with her. And I know why my grandmother adored her 
like crazy. And there's also the story of yeah. when my grandmother found out she was adopted, she was in a bathtub and her sister comes running in, older sister comes running in and said, Laos, Laos, we're adopted. And she's like, I don't care. Mom's mom, dad's dad, whatever, you know, and these kind of stories, I can see those personalities in myself or my kids and things like that. And they just make you connect to something. And even the tragic stories of my husband has a, uh, multiple great grandfather. In fact, we're not Lee's we're really Garnett's, but mm -hmm. because this ancestor escaped from the law, and when you research his story, you discover, wait, in one year, he was out in California during the gold rush and he was doing great. But then there was a flood and it wiped out the entire town. From then on, he lost his wife. He lost his kids. Maybe he didn't lose his wife. I know he lost two children mm -hmm. and he lost his business. And this guy is just absolutely devastated. And then he goes and does petty crime and all this other crazy stuff. But you could see why, why you did that. He was hopeless. Of course he would do something. Either he would rise above or he would turn the wrong path and it becomes a cautionary tale. And then his son was like, I'm not going to be, you know, known as a Garnet anymore. We're going to be Lee's. We're just going to totally change our identity. And so connection and belong the good, the bad, the other ugly, everything in between just, yeah, I don't know how else to say it other than connection and belonging. Yeah. And, and I think personally, I like the stories that are a little bit more colorful because that just makes it that much more interesting. I think. Right. Um, right. People. Oh, I, speaking how, of colorful. How do you go about, oh, go ahead. Yeah, no, you go ahead. I want to hear okay. colorful. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, um, so I remember being in a workshop one time and I had said, you know, you do not have angel women who aren't perfect. Right. And this Southern woman, oh my gosh, I love Southern women. She just said, oh no, my grandma, she was an angel. And I'm like, uh, I bet <laughs> if you go back, she has a few stories to tell. And, and, and you, you appreciate the angelic nature of the people when you see what they've gone through no matter what it was. Right. And so, yeah, I, I, I like real stories, colorful or not. I want it yes. to be real. I hate the word authentic because it's been misabused. I just want the accurate real picture of somebody. And if they were an honorable person throughout their life, great. How did that come to be? That's what I want to know. Yeah, I agree. How, Devin, do you go about writing a story? Do you have a, a plan in place that you use or some kind of system or do you just free ball it? <laughs> well, it depends on what I'm writing. If I'm writing <laughs> personal history, um, I use my favorite thing to do is use photos as a prompt. Yeah. Um, because I believe there is a scrapbooker. Her name is Debbie Hodge. And I believe her website is called get it scrapped. And her, uh, philosophy when I was doing scrapbooking was give photos, their stories. So mm -hmm. every photo you have, it, it creates a connection to your memories. And so I will go and do the, who, the, what, the, when, the, why, the, how of the story. And then I'll actually add the backstory. There's a workshop I gave at Roots Tech and it's on my main channel, Write Your Family History, talking about the five simple steps for writing the story of you. And it goes through the process how of I'd start with the story and what I do in order to capture the story. Um, so personal history, that's usually where I start with a photo. When I'm talking about an ancestor, yeah. I believe record by record, sentence by sentence, you can write the stories of your ancestors life even if you don't have a creative writing, journalistic or historical background, right? If you're not a writer, just grab a record and then you go through my recipe for writing family history process. I have a book that's available on Amazon in both um, print and Kindle version. And you just go through this. And by the end, you're not going to have a page turner, but you will have that first draft completed. And then you can decide, do I want to polish up the syntax? Or do I want to go and leverage storyboarding and story crafting techniques that my colleagues are excel at teaching? That's not my forte. My forte is yeah. getting to the first draft finished and then using some journalistic techniques to polish it, inviting somebody else to do the proofreading for the syntax <laughs> and publish that. 
I, I, I will definitely link your, your book uh, oh, on that. We have kind of a homepage for each of our guests on the podcast. So I will make sure to link that, that on there. Um, do you have, do you have a certain link? This is always kind of a big question. Like, I think that people um, feel like they have to, you know, write a book or write lots and lots about each thing. Do you feel like you have a certain link that you kind of tend to gravitate to, or are you just, is small okay with you? Short. Well, um, I'm recently going to be putting out a video that talks about what are your, what is your goals? And there's, are you trying to be very deep? Or are you trying to be shallow? Are you trying to do multiple generations? Or are you trying to do one person? Personally, when I am finished um, homeschooling my kids in five years, I get to retire from homeschooling and focus on turning those 120 <laughs> drafts into um, biographies, you know, yeah. and it could be a 90 page biography. It could be a 10 page. It just, just all depends on the ancestor and what information I have to them. But I think there's nothing wrong with by bi doing biographical sketches. And I'm sorry that I keep promoting all of my content, but I'm really, no, I'm glad you do. Yeah, glad you do. Definitely. I'm passionate about teaching people how to write and to write non-boring family histories. So recently I did a webinar um, and it's free. It's on the Write Your Family History channel. And there's even a handout that's for free as well. And it's talked about how to write non-boring biographical sketches. Now, the idea of a sketch is it's short, but it doesn't have to be boring. Right. Sketch doesn't mean boring. And so length isn't a problem. And length is dependent probably on three factors. One, what's the scope? Do you want to be narrow and go in depth? Um, actually, scope and depth go together. Do you want to wipe about one person and go really deep? Or do you want to do multiple generations and you're okay if it's a little shallow? The other thing that's going to determine length is your writing experience. If you've never written anything to before, please don't pick the ancestor from the 1700s that you have two documents on. Pick somebody more recent yeah. and you can go in depth by make sure you process all the stories that you've gathered from them, all of the records you have. It's going to be fun and it's going to teach you a lot of different skills. And then you can go do, all right, I want to do the descendants of Joseph Geisler, the, my German immigrant ancestor, and just have a little brief, non-boring sketch that's anywhere from 500 words to a thousand, but it's not a biography. So I don't know if that answers your question. It really all kind of comes to bend down to your scope, how deep yeah. you want to go and what your writing experience is. The more experience you have, or the more research you've done, the more you can write longer, the more inexperienced you are, then I'm going to recommend you do a bunch of sketches. Yeah. And I think that, no, I think that was perfect. That answered that really well. And I think that, you know, especially for those newbies and the beginners that are just getting into family history, mm -hmm. um, I think that's great advice to, you know, find that some, something that, you know, that you can write about. It's a lot easier um, to do that. So that was great advice. Um, do you have any, um, can you recommend any resources or tools besides, I mean, if anybody, if they've not been to your website, like they need to go and again, we'll have all that linked because you have so many resources and, <laughs> and videos. It's just, it's a treasure trove, Thank you. Um, but do you have any outside resources or tools that, that you use when you're, when you're writing your family stories? Well, I'll tell you the tools that I've been using of late um, for a very specific project. Okay. And it's kind of funny that this is being interviewed by Story because I actually used Story to help me out. Um, and you didn't plan this. So, hey. and you're not paying me <laughs> for not. it either. But let me tell you what I did. <laughs> so, um, I have been redoing some scrapbooks from when I was in middle school and high school. And the reason why I'm redoing it, some people say, never redo a scrapbook. Well, I did these scrapbooks about 15 years ago, and I have more memorabilia. I have yearbooks that I want to capture and insert into the pages. I have more. Um, I just have more. <laughs> and it doesn't fit into the current layout I have. So I was redoing these, and I could remember these little bullet points. Um, my best friend's name was Tina Park. She was Vietnamese. We played volleyball together. We liked the same guys, but we never fought over them. 
five simple sentences. <laughs> well, I went into story yeah. assist on storied and plugged that in huh. and out spat a pretty good draft. Now, was it perfect? <laughs> no, there are a couple of things that are a little wonky, like talking about yeah. Vietnamese food. Well, I never really ate Vietnamese food, but it did nail <laughs> our sleepovers and what we did there. And I hadn't even put that in. And then I just yeah. captured that and revised it and put it into my scrapbook page. So I kind of actually like that tool. And the more I play with it, the more it's an easy way to get started. Um, if I'm writing about my ancestors, I don't really have an outside tool, except when it comes to the improving your writing phase. Grammarly.com is a blessing. It doesn't yeah. catch everything, but passive voice, oh my heck. It helps find all my passive <laughs> voice and I can rewrite it to make it better. Um, they new, now have a new little, um, if you buy the premium version, they have this new little AI tool um, that will take a paragraph you wrote and give you suggestions on how to improve it. And then you accept the uh, paragraph that you like and then you improve it. But I do have to caution you. You don't want your voice to sound like the AI tools. I have a book called that I wrote right. called um, From Metal to Rhinestones, The Crust for the Crown. And it was about my first three years of competing in beauty pageants. And I was a heavy metal um, tomboy, didn't know anything about hair and makeup, <laughs> but I secretly wanted to be in beauty pageants because the Miss Teen USA and Miss USA pageants were always on television. And I was like, one day I want to do that. But I was absolutely <laughs> clueless. Like I was more clueless than the girl in the movie Clueless about fashion and makeup. Um, <laughs> And so I wrote this book and one of the best comments I ever had was from a reader who also watched my YouTube channels or has been to several of my workshops. She said, this sounds like you. So not only did I write my story, grammar problems and all, I'm sure, but she said, it sounds like me. So don't be afraid if you don't have this proper English voice. Um, use the tools, but don't take away your personal voice. So if you say, you know, I'm fixing to clean up the kitchen, then you need to write that way. So right. those are the tools, but also a caution that I have. Yeah, I, I love that. That was perfect advice. I think that, that people do try to take that away. They want it to be all polished and perfect. And it really does need to be in your voice. That, right. That's what makes it so, those stories so incredible. Absolutely. You you touched on this, Devin, a little bit. Tell us how you, especially for somebody that's a, a real newbie, how might you use historical records mm -hmm. um, to help you tell a story? Okay. Well, again, I'm going to go back to a recipe for writing family history. The first thing you do is you transcribe that record. Grab every single stinking detail you ha can find on that document, even if it's a city directory and there's barely any details. You can yeah. actually turn it into a story. So the first thing you do is transcribe it. Then this is where the AI tools can get, get handy, right? Oh, or you can just do it old school like I do. Both are taught on my channel. You rearrange what you transcribed into kind of a story. So there'll be things like born on this date to these people, whatever. That's not a story. You've transcribed it, but it's not a, a story. It's not a paragraph. So take those facts and turn them into a sentence. And then the next step is to mark it up. Okay, so Bob Jones and Sarah Doe had a daughter. So how old were they when they had that daughter? Where were they from? Where was the child born? What's the distance between those locations? Were they married? Where, how long were they married? What's the birth order? Do you see where I'm going? Yes. All of a sudden, you are putting context into the arrival of this child into the family. And you just pretend either you are a parent and what was it like when child number two was born? What are all the details? What are the family context? What's happening? Um, do all of that familial context, and then you've ar already started uh, embellishing your story. And then you just do it with every other detail that you can from that 
record. So the record is the launching pad to ask questions of how to put things in. And then if you want to take it a step further after familial context, then you put in both geographical context. So I live on a Mesa, 77,500 feet above sea level in a desert, but it's a pretty desert. It's not like the Sahara sand, nothing desert. It's actually has pine trees and cedar wood and whatever. So I can talk about that, but that's going to be very, very different than somebody who's from Appalachia or Alaska or upstate New York. And so you put the geographical details in there, that setting. And then if you really want to take it a step up, then put historical context. I remember yeah. writing a story about my um, husband's grandmother, and she was born on the day Trotsky was banished by Lenin. And you're thinking, well, why would I, why would you say that? Because I just told you what period in time in history this is happening, yeah. right? And so you can start putting these sights and sounds. There's another story that I have when I discovered that my grandfather on December 25th, uh, 1990, 45, I believe it was, he was on his ship crossing the Strait of Gibraltar headed home. And so what was a popular song at Christmas time during World War II? I'll be home for Christmas if only in my dreams. Now, I never say that that was played on the ship because I don't know if it was. And I never say if it's their favorite song, but you could wonder if I'll be home for Christmas, if only in my dreams, was something the two of them were reflecting on because he really was on his way home. Yeah. So those are the three. That's how you should go from a record to a story. It's mm-hmm. all explained in for more details with examples in a recipe for writing family history and then in the writing challenges that I'm starting to release on the Write Your Family History channel. That's, that's awesome. I think people just get kind of, they again, look for that, um, when they were born, you know, and what their names were. And there's so, like you said, so many other things that you can use to embellish your story. I, I'm a huge proponent of historical and social context. It's just right. amazing to me what you can, can add into those stories. So those were great tips. Great tips. Hi, <laughs> this is great. I'm thoroughly enjoying this. You have so much good advice. Thank you. This is, this is always my <laughs> This is always my favorite part. I I love to ask people to tell us what is a what is a favorite family story um, that you have. <laughs> you know, I I knew this question was coming, and my answer is picking a favorite is like picking a favorite kid. I can't. My favorite <laughs> kid is the one who's being the nicest to me right now. You know. <laughs> And you know, that's what everybody tells me. And they're like, well, my favorite story right now is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I'll tell you two favorites. So I do have, if we can qualify it, my favorite story growing up was the story of my mom and her dad. So my dad and my, I'm mean, at my dad my mom's dad. So Papa and granny love to do social dancing, foxtrot, waltz, all those, right? And so Papa, which would have been my mom's dad, taught her how to dance by having her little shoes on his feet and dancing around the living room. And I just loved that because (laughs) I liked to do social dancing and my dad never did that with me. Besides, my family didn't know how to do the Texas two steps. So I can't actually blame them. But because (laughs) of my love of dancing, I'm attracted to that story. And I've been attracted to that story the longest. And the reason why I point that out is because small insignificant little memories, like you had said earlier, just one sentence of them writing, small, what seemingly insignificant stories are very powerful. So then my, my most recent favorite story is one I haven't fleshed out right now. It is incredibly interesting because it is changing my perspective of women's roles in the past and Mm -hmm. the roles of colored women in the past. So Mm -hmm. as far as I've discovered so far using newspaperarchive.com, I believe it is, um, Mm -hmm. and some other newspaper websites, I have discovered a great, multiple great aunts who was a doctor. Now let's figure out if you can determine what time period this is. Yeah. Her husband died during Andersonville, in Andersonville jail during the civil war. Yeah. You got the time period in mind now? Yeah. 
when she's a widow, she becomes a doctor, a female doctor, kind of like my own Dr. Quinn medicine woman. Through wow. newspapers, I discovered that she was in articles with other female doctors getting their degrees and having practices. Another article tells me that she was one of the most well-paid doctoresses, if you will, in Cincinnati, Ohio. Now here's the kicker. There's another article that came out with a Dr. Consuelo, and I can't remember her last name right now. Dr. Consuelo credited Dr. Elmira for helping her by being her mentor and Consuelo had recently graduated with her medical degree. Not only that she had, and this is the name that was at the time, the Cincinnati colored high school. Wow. Yeah. Not only that, her father was the principal of this colored high school. And then she goes on and I, I, I just saw the newspaper article. I'm like, ah, how am I going to figure out anything more about this lady? Right. I go over to family search. Thankfully, some people had already started compiling information about her and she became a leading doctor, female doctor, colored female doctor in the early 1900s and late 1800s. I'm That's just incredible. blown away. And I don't yeah. know all the details, but that's, that's the little bit that I've gathered so far. I can't wait to break the AI tools at going, oh, wait, there's a female doctor who's colored and there's this <laughs> other female doctor who's very well paid and influential in her community. I, it just, we have to go into our genealogy histories and not go with present eyes not take our present view and project it onto the past. Let the yeah. stories present themselves, good, bad, other, you know, whatever. But that's the new favorite one that I'm working on right now. Unfortunately, I have a business and kids to homeschool, so I can only work <laughs> on it a little bit. So in 10 years, ask me about it. I probably will have it written by then. <laughs> that is incredible. Yeah. And it, it also made me think, it also made me think too, I, it's funny that just all these commonalities. So my husband actually had, um, a multiple great grandfather that, that died in Andersonville, mm -hmm. um, during the civil war. Yeah. And I've just come across recently and I don't know the name of it. I'll have to email you, but there is a book that is, the a first hand account of one of the soldiers that was imprisoned at Andersonville. So mm -hmm. I can't wait to to read that. I I have it downloaded so that I can read it at another time. But just that first hand account, um, sure. I think would be incredible um, sure. to read. And Cincinnati, I'm, I'm my ancestors were all from Cincinnati, <laughs> so they're good. We're just we're common yeah. common things here, left yeah. and right. What's interesting um, is this family line isn't really from Cincinnati. She just went there afterwards and then she school? just died in Missouri. So I didn't realize that she passed through Cincinnati where some of my other relatives were. And I just go, wait, I wonder, you know, she's on the right side of town. Could she have been with my other side of my family? Because my, there is no tree collapse or endogamy, but I wonder if there's just this intermixing. I don't uh -huh. know. <laughs> So where, where would she have come from, Devin, to be in Cincinnati? Where was she prior to that? So she was in Huron County, Ohio. And then okay. I'm not entirely sure. Again, I haven't fully researched everything. I'm just, I'm now getting yeah. excited because I've been diving into newspapers, my second favorite genealogy re records collection. And, um, and I'm picking all this stuff up. Now I want to know like, okay, so you were in Huron. How'd you get here? Um, <laughs> Yeah. So I don't yeah. know why, but then she goes over to Palmyra, Missouri, and that's where she ended. She didn't end her life. That's where her life ended. <laughs> Gotta be careful right. what right. order your words go. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and don't you think too, that's, that's one of the things I love so much about genealogy is that it's, you're always finding new things. You know, there's, there's never an end. There's, you're never going to be done because there's always that, that next story or, or record for you to yeah. find. So yeah. yeah. Um, well, the records do run out. They do run in yeah. eventually and you have to move on to a different relative. That's kind of hard, you know, but, um, yes. 
the yeah. more records that come online and are searchable, this is the, this is the time to be a genealogist. 10, 15, I, I started yes. 30 years ago and it was impossible. Mm -hmm. Now yes. I'm just like, oh, look what I can find in 10 minutes using um, queries on a newspaper. It's amazing. It really is. Well, Devin, what I would love for you to just kind of, you've given us all kinds of tips and tricks, but what if you wanted to just leave kind of maybe words of wisdom again for those, those beginning genealogists, what would you, you say to them if they were just starting out fresh, totally fresh, never done a, a family tree or anything, what would you, what would you recommend to them? Okay. So I wasn't sure if you were going to go through beginning researcher or beginner writer, because I have two different tips. So if you don't mind, I'll do the beginning researcher and remind me to come back to the beginner writer. Yeah, absolutely. The beginner researcher, preserve the perishable. Fires, flood, death, divorce, family fights, all of that is going to destroy what you already have. No one alive today should have to be researched tomorrow. So get out your photo albums, label them, organize them, digitize them, share them with everybody and their dog that you can think of. And there are plenty of um, articles about all of that stuff on my channel and my colleagues' channels. That is the first step. Preserve the perishable. Talk to yeah. people. Get their stories. I'll give you an urgency one. I didn't know this, but six months before my mom passed away, I finally asked her the question of, how did you and dad join the religion that you guys chose? I knew bits and pieces of the story and she finally wrote that story. And I was, I'm so grateful for it. But then she passed away six months later. In her records, I found her life story. It took me all through my mom was boy crazy. It's no surprise. I was boy crazy until I met my husband. Who's the ultimate dude in my life and my partner in family history fanatics. Um, and then I didn't have to be boy crazy anymore because I just had the boy to be crazy about, but her story stops a year and a half before she met my dad. So I have all these stories of all these people she thought were attractive and a couple of people she went out and dates with, but not the story of how she met my dad, who the heck is Moose, who she was dating and my dad stole him from. I mean, like, yes, yeah, talk to people, <laughs> get their records, yeah. preserve them, ask questions, preserve the perishable preserve the perishable. I could keep going on. I have so many things to talk about on that. But when it comes to writing, the most important thing to do when writing is to take, please forgive me, take the English grammar teacher and <laughs> tell them to go sit in the corner. They're not ready yet. Yes. You yes. want them, but not at the beginning. Yeah. They are there when you revise your draft, not when you get it out of your brain. My next thing is, like yeah. I said, with personal history, use pictures and just speak it out. If you need to record your voice, if you can't type it, um, yes. just get it out of your brain. And then we can fix the syntax in the organization letter with ancestors record by record, sentence by sentence, you can write their stories. Yeah. But the whole point is tell the grammar person, you need to go to timeout. Yeah. I will talk to you later. And yes, you that you will never have a blank page or writer's block when you start writing. That's great. And I don't ever take offense at that. I okay. agree totally. <laughs> <laughs> Woo! There are some English teachers who don't. My husband wrote a book called How to Fail English with Style about all the papers he turned into his English teacher and all the commentary she gave. And then his rebuttal <laughs> 20 years later. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> it's available on Amazon too if you want to fun oh, read. <laughs> I'll have to check that out. That's great. Well, Devin, you are... You are just, your passion shines through and you are just a wealth of information. It oh, has been you. such a pleasure and I just feel honored that you spent time with me this afternoon. So thank you for that. My pleasure. Anytime. If anybody has further questions or you want me back for anything, if it's writing, I'm there. Uh, it is my <laughs> passion. It absolutely is my passion. Oh, I love that. Well, thank you so much. Until next time, friends, embrace the power of your family's untold tales and embark on a journey of discovery. Let the ink flow 
and the words dance as you weave together the threads of your ancestors' lives. Start writing your family stories today and let their voices echo through the generations to come at story.com. Have a great day, everyone. And that brings us to the end of this episode of The Family Treehouse, where we celebrate the power of storytelling and preserving our family legacies. Story is more than just a platform for sharing stories. Dive into those historical records and newspapers, discovering the hidden gems that bring your ancestors to life. Add branches to your family tree, connecting the dots between generations. Thank you for joining us on this storytelling journey. Your stories matter, and through story, they have the power to resonate across time and touch the hearts of generations to come. Keep uncovering your family's history and keep the spirit of storytelling alive with Storied.